So in this video, we're going to have a look at the definition of the limit of a multivariable real function. So we've already studied limits of single variable real functions, so where the domain is the real numbers or a subset of the real numbers and the codomain is also the real numbers. We're now going to generalize that concept to multivariable functions where the domain will be some real n space and the codomain will be some other real m space where n and m are not necessarily the same. So our multivariable function, we'll call it f, is going to be from real n space and we'll, or some subset of real n space rn and it will be mapping into real m space rm where n and m are not necessarily the same thing and we want to have a look at both the epsilon delta definition for limits of multivariable functions like this and also the sequence characterization for limits of multivariable functions as well. So the notation for the limit of a multivariable function is exactly the same. We write the limit as x approaches x0, where x0 is now some point in Rn, so it's a vector of our function f of x, which of course is a vector function. So the output here is not just a single real number unless m is 1, uh, but is going to be more generally a vector. So it's going to take as input a vector and spit out a vector. And I've drawn a picture here for our multivariable function with the example n is equal to 2 and m is equal to 2. So here is our domain, r2. Here is our codomain, also r2. Here is our point x0, which is some vector in r2. And then we can look at where the function is mapping x0 onto. It might be here, for example, uh, in r2. But when we're asking about the limit as x approaches x0 of the function, what we're really interested in is as you get closer and closer to it from all the different directions and you look at what those points that are very close to x0 are being mapped onto by the function, so what they're being mapped onto in R2, is there some point that we're getting closer and closer to as you get closer and closer to x0 in the codomain, sorry, in the domain, is there some point in the codomain that the image of these points is getting closer and closer to. Uh, and of course, if that thing that you're getting closer and closer to is the value that the function maps x0 onto, that will be then the definition of the function being continuous at that point, analogous to in the single variable case. So we can call the limit L, and again, to stress that this is no longer just a real number unless m is equal to 1, but more generally it's going to be a vector. So in this case, where we've got r2 to r2, rl will be a vector in r2, a two-dimensional vector. So let's begin then with the epsilon delta definition for the limit of a multivariable function, and then we'll see the sequence characterization. So if but it is true that the limit as x approaches x0 of f of x is equal to this limit vector L, then the criterion that needs to be satisfied in order for you to be able to say that is that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that if you take a point x that is a distance away from x0 less than delta, so the norm of x minus x0 is less than delta, that's the distance between this vector x and your vector x0. So you can imagine drawing a little, well, in this example of r2 to r2, you can imagine drawing a little disk of radius delta around x0, and then all the points that are within that disk, um, those are the points that we're interested in, and the, the distance is greater than zero, that excludes the center point. So just like in single variable functions, we want to exclude the center point because actually what the function is being mapped onto at x zero has nothing to do with what the limit as x approaches x zero of the function is. Um, so you take any point where the distance from x zero is greater than zero but less than delta, then the distance between what x is being mapped onto by the function, so f of x, which is a vector, and our limit vector l is less than epsilon. So again, we can imagine drawing an epsilon disk in this example of r2 to r2 around our limit vector l, and what this is saying is that there must exist a delta disk around x0 such that everything apart from the center point is mapped onto that epsilon disk around l. And that must hold true no matter what epsilon you pick, that there is a delta disk such that it's mapped entirely into the uh, epsilon disk around L, 
excluding the center point. So I've drawn this on the picture. So for all epsilon greater than zero, I can draw this, and now I'm going to introduce a new term, ball. And this is a term that's good to get used to, and notation that's good to get used to, because it's going to follow us into higher parts of analysis and indeed topology. Um, so we denote this like so, b for ball, and then you put the radius of the ball, which in this case is epsilon, and you put the center point of the ball in the brackets here, which in this case is the limit vector L. So this means the epsilon ball around the point L, and the definition of this is all the points in your space, and in this case it's Rm, so all y, all vectors in Rm, such that the distance, which is the uh, Euclidean norm of y minus L, is less than epsilon. So it means all the points where the distance from that point to L is less than epsilon. And we denote that set like so, and we call it the ball uh, of radius epsilon around L, or even better, the open ball of radius epsilon around L, because it, it has a less than here. If it was less than or equal to, it would then be the closed ball because it would contain the boundary. When it doesn't contain the boundary, it then ends up being an open set because all of the points are interior points. Um, so that's a bit of terminology that's used, good to get used to. Um, as I say, if it was less than or equal to, it would then be the closed ball. So what for all epsilon greater than zero, you can draw an open ball around your limit vector L. Now in this case, of course, uh, the case of R2, these open balls are actually open disks, you could refer them to. But the word ball obviously comes from the three-dimensional uh, case. So if you imagine all the points that are a radius epsilon away from a vector in R3, then it will look like a ball. There'll be a sphere of points which doesn't contain the boundary. Uh, and then in higher dimensions, it's kind of like a hypersphere. So that's where the term ball comes from, but in this case you could call it a disk as well, the open disk. Uh, but as I say, it's good to get used to this notation and this name because it will follow us into higher parts of maths. So for all epsilon greater than zero, you can draw the open ball around your limit vector L, and there must exist an open ball around your um, po point, your vector that you're approaching in the limit, um, there must exist a delta ball around that point such that everything in that delta ball, apart from the center point itself, so apart from x0, is mapped into your epsilon ball around L. So you must be able to find a delta ball for every single epsilon greater than zero. That's the epsilon delta definition for us to say that the limit of uh, this function as x approaches x0 is equal to L. And again, I hope you appreciate that this is a formal capturing of the intuitive concept of convergence, which is that as you get closer and closer to x0, you get indefinitely close to the limit L and you stay indefinitely close. Because what this is saying is no matter how close you want to be, which corresponds to the epsilons, I can always find you this open ball, this delta ball around x0 such that everything in that is that close to the limit. Not just one thing in it is that close to the limit, but everything is that close to the limit. So it truly does capture that however close you want to get to, we do indeed get that close to it as you approach x0, and we also stay that close because everything in the ball, apart from the center point itself, is being mapped that close. So that's the epsilon delta definition. Let's now look at the sequence characterization. Now this is exactly analogous to the single variable function case. Uh, and the proofs of the equivalence of the epsilon delta definition and the sequence characterization is exactly analogous to in the single variable case. I will go through them, but probably briefly compared to how I went through them in my video on limits of single variable functions. So first the statement then of the sequence characterization. So the epsilon delta definition of the limit as x approaches x0 of f of x equaling L is equivalent to the sequence characterization, which is what I've written here. And what it says is that if you take any domain sequence, so this is a sequence of vectors, this is denoting a sequence of vectors, xn, that converges to x0, so it's a sequence of vectors in the domain that converges to x0, but none of the terms in the sequence are x0 itself, because we're not interested in the actual center point when we're talking about the limit. Um, so if you take any one of those sequences, 
then if you look at the code domain sequence or the image sequence, which is you take each one of the terms in this sequence and you map it onto what it is in the codomain, so you take f of xn and you get a new sequence, a sequence in the codomain, then that image sequence or codomain sequence will converge to the limit L. So if the epsilon delta definition is satisfied, then this is true, i.e. every domain sequence that converges to x0 where the terms of the sequence are not allowed to be x0 itself, the image sequence will converge to the limit L. But it also works the other way around. If it's the case that every domain sequence, not including terms that are equal to x0, that converges to x0, if you look at its image sequence, it converges always, and it converges always to the same value, a value L, then you can conclude that the epsilon delta definition is satisfied. So these two actually are equivalent characterizations of the concept of the limit of a function, both in single variable case and in the multivariable case. So just to make this absolutely clear, I've written out my sequence um, a little bit here. So x1, x2, x3, this is what I'm saying here. And this is a domain sequence, a sequence of vectors in the domain that is converging to x0 and none of these terms in this sequence are allowed to actually equal x0 itself. Then its image sequence, what I mean by that is you take each one of the terms here and you map them into the image, uh, into the codomain, so f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, and you get a new sequence, which is then what we'll call the image or the codomain sequence. And if it's true that the epsilon delta definition is satisfied, i.e. the limit as x approaches x0 of f of x is equal to L, then this sequence is always guaranteed to converge to L. And the other way around that I stated is that if it's true that any domain sequence, if you look at its image sequence, it always converges to the same value, then you can conclude also that the limit as x approaches x0 of f of x is equal to L and that the epsilon delta definition is satisfied. So the epsilon delta definition and the sequence characterization are equivalent to one another, so I put a biconditional symbol here, meaning that if this one's true, it implies this one is true, that's the forward arrow, and if this one's true, it implies that this one's true, that's the backward arrow. And when we're proving certain things about limits of multivariable functions, sometimes it's easier to use epsilon delta definition, and other times it's easier to use sequence characterization, so that's why knowing these two different ways of thinking about it is useful. So we'll have a break here, and in the next video I'll go over the proof of this equivalence. As I say, the arguments are exactly the same as in the single variable case, so I'll try and do this briefly. Also note that the definition that I've given you here actually works fine if n and m are both 1, reducing it to the single variable case. Open balls in the one-dimensional case are just open intervals, and this epsilon delta definition will just turn into the epsilon delta definition for the single variable case because these Euclidean norms in the one-dimensional case are just equal to the modulus functions.